A word of warning. This podcast explores graphic and disturbing stories and includes some strong language. It therefore may not be suitable for our young listeners or other folks who may find it disturbing. Hello and welcome to True Crime Daily, the podcast covering high profile and under the radar cases from across the country every week. I'm your host, Anna Garcia. How can one doctor in Michigan over the course of four decades sexually assault potentially thousands of young people and many of them teens? Dr. Robert Anderson was the school physician at the University of Michigan from 1967 to 2003, where, according to court records, he sexually abused athletes during what should have been routine medical checkups. While he worked at the university, he also worked at the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration, where he allegedly did the same to pilots and air traffic controllers who required medical exams to keep their licenses up to date. He reportedly did thousands of exams in association with the FAA. Dr. Robert Anderson died in 2008, so he cannot be held to pay for his crimes. But the institutions that look the other way when all of this was going on are being held accountable today. One of the many former athletes leading that fight for justice is John Vaughn. He was recruited in 1988. John was a star football player at the University of Michigan who played in back-to-back Rose Bowls. From Michigan, John was drafted by the New England Patriots. He also played for the Seattle Seahawks and the Kansas City Chiefs. John is going to join us in a few minutes from Michigan, where he has been camped out in front of the university president's house in protest to how the survivors have been treated through this entire ordeal. Here is a clip from a documentary about John produced by Kendall Bolin called Hail to the Victims. Former Michigan running back and Dr. Robert Anderson survivor John Vaughn is into his protest outside the home of U of M President Mark Schlissel. Vaughn is one of 850 or so former Michigan athletes now suing the university over Anderson's abuses. Who says he was sexually assaulted by Dr. Anderson countless times. It sounds like the president hasn't come out, might not come out. How long does John feel like he can stay out there? He's going to take it in 30 day increments. So he's in here for the long haul. doctor was allowed to sexually assault and rape students on this campus for close to 40 years. And then the university and its culture of enablement allowed that to happen, empowered him, and then covered it up for the past half century. They will go down in history as the most insidious cover-up in the history of sports. A few months ago in January of 2022, the University of Michigan settled multiple lawsuits covering more than 1,000 victims of Dr. Anderson. The university agreed to pay $490 million to the survivors and set aside an additional $30 million for future claimants. But John Vaughn says... That is not enough. John is joining us now from Michigan. John, I know you had this massive protest outside the president's house. You had your camper out there. You had supporters. And they end up towing this. And 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 you just, you're not giving up. You're back out there again. You're still protesting. Yes. Um, well, how are you doing? i um, glad to be I'm, here. I'm good, John. It's good to see you. Thank you. Um, I think more than anything else, uh, the university has tried to silence us uh, at every turn. And, uh, you know, what I've learned over the last couple, you know, two years since finding out about Dr. Anderson is universities use their brand and their might to silence survivors. Um, And They went so far as to go outside of their jurisdiction and commit a crime. Uh, Not only did they steal uh, the camper, but everything, all the signs, uh, other tents, T-shirts, thousands of T-shirts that we had out there for the students and supporters. Um, But they also, in trying to silence us, you know, stepped on our First Amendment right uh, and some of our human uh, rights as citizens 
of the United States. So, John, you're back out there in a tent now, and you haven't given up the fight. I- I'm curious here, John. The university has admitted that these heinous, heinous things happened to students. They they say that in the time that Dr. Anderson was there, he could have seen as many as 7,000 students. So that would be the universe of potential victims and survivors. So, you know, they've settled these lawsuits, but you feel like you haven't gotten what you need from the university. What, what's your goal? What, what do you need to have happen? Well, and, and just to clarify, there was a agreement in principle um, on the settlement amount. Uh, we're still in a process of negotiating the master settlement agreement. So we're nowhere near uh, settlement and closure for so many survivors. But there are so many other issues that uh, you know, the analogy I give people is really only the tip of the iceberg has been covered. There's so many tentacles and uh, insidious like connectors that this case is much larger than just uh, what Dr. Anderson did. Um, simply put, this is the largest sexual assault rape and cover up in the history of sports. I think that may very well be given the huge amount of verified victims. I think, you know, what really troubles me, it troubles me as a parent, um, the mother of a young man, is how many students tried to complain for a very long time and how they were never taken seriously. And that means that the predator was allowed to continue his crimes. Yeah, I mean, he was not only empowered, but enabled to gorge uh, an insatiable appetite for sexual assault and rape. John, what do you want the university to do? Because I've you know, that documentary about you is, is very moving. And I think, and we're going to link to it for everyone to be able to see it because I think it, it gives you um, so much of a clear picture. But I, I get the sense that the fact that you all don't feel, this is my interpretation, don't feel like you have been treated with the dignity and the respect which you all deserve, require, and should have in this process of dealing with what really happened that is making this that much worse. Am I am I wrong on that? Absolutely. Um, even in the so-called apology that the university gave us, it was apologizing for Dr. Anderson, but the university has never apologized for his part in enabling this monster. As well as if you look at these cases, you know, outside of like a code case, you know, a body or a murder, we're referred to as Jane and John Doe's, which the duality of it is, it's when we were at the university, you and I'm performing and excelling at football. My name was John Vaughn, but to you, I'm John, you know, John Doe. And I think what that, what, what that does is it helps in suppressing public outrage because I don't know how to humanly connect with a Jane or John Doe, a face is nameless victim. And if you look at just the myriad of cases that have gone on in the United States over the last 20 years, that has been the MO of these institutions. So they keep their brands and their narrative out in the forefront and they continue to, you know, it's really a tactic of just sweeping this under the rug and not taking full accountability for the atrocities that they enable. John, you've publicly shared that at the time of the sexual assaults that had been committed on you, that it didn't, you didn't quite understand it. You were having these unnecessary exams of your genitals, rectal exams that were unnecessary, prostate exams that were unnecessary for a young man, and that it wasn't until a few years ago when the story broke in the news, I believe is the Detroit News, about 
Dr. Anderson and how many victims there were. And there was a lot of focus on the football team as well, along with other teams for the university. And it was at that moment you shared that it all came out. Could you share more of that with us? Yeah, I, I, and I'll be quick. Um, so my mother has, my mother was diagnosed with breast cancer in my senior year. Almost simultaneously at the time, the you know, University of Michigan came on my high school campus and started recruiting. Um, Les Miles was, uh, was not only a player for Bo and at Michigan, now he was a coach and he was recruiting me. And so he saw the entire process that I'm dealing with as I'm making choices of schools and whatnot, but I'm dealing with my mother. I'm the youngest of two boys, um, no brother, other brothers and sisters that my mom has breast cancer. And then when I go up to my recruiting trip, one of the things that as I meet Bo Schembechler for the first time, he asked about my mother's recovery because she wasn't able to come in January of 88. It's a big recruiting weekend. He asked how her treatment was going. And then so in my first exam in August of 1988, one of the first things that Dr. Anderson says is, you see that there's cancer in your history. And then he begins, you know, a typical uh, physical exam and says that we must do a prostate cancer screening exam as well as a testicular cancer screening exam. Now at 18, I didn't even know what a prostate was, but I did know what cancer was. I was terrified of cancer. And so I felt like, yeah, do whatever test you have to do to ensure that I don't have cancer. Oh, you know, you're, you know, you're so young at 18. So young, so innocent. Oh, I'm so sorry this happened to you, John. I'm really sorry. Okay. So we have a lot more to discuss here. Excuse me. I needed a moment. It's, you know, John, do you have children by any chance? I do. Um, I have four, four daughters. Um, I very rarely speak about them publicly because from the first time that I came out um, and uh, told my truths in an article, I started getting death threats. Uh, character assassination and things like that. So I've, I've wanted to protect them uh, this course. whole time. Uh, but as a father, I understand the process of coming into people's homes and telling the mother or the father that you're going to protect their children. Uh, when in essence, you weren't offering a scholarship in our case at Michigan you are offering the copay of rape because that superseded anything else that, you know, the advantages that uh, as scholarship athletes was totally wiped out. And now that's looking back at the age of 50 when I found this out, but still at 18, you know, I explained to people that, you know, playing football at the University of Michigan or any big time college program back in those days, you were in a constant state of being uncomfortable but trained to excel in a sport that is organized chaos. So you learn to sacrifice your basic needs of comfort, raise your pain threshold, your uncomfortability for the greater good of the team. Um, and at Michigan, it was about the pursuit of becoming a Michigan man. That was the carrot that we were all promised. So there was all that pressure to not only succeed at the university, but you have all these pressures to you know, upheld your, your, your family, uh, your school, your community uh, of being a successful you know, college athlete. According to court records, John, in 1975, a wrestler who was being abused there at the University of Michigan complained to his coaches and he claims that he was laughed at and nothing was done. I'm not surprised. This has been verified. We're not making this up. We see this all the time. People are not willing to believe the victims and survivors. It undoes me, especially with young people. 
Then in 2018, the wrestler made a formal complaint to the university, and that prompted the the investigation by the University of Michigan Police Department, which, again, confirms much of what we're talking about here. Now, for this part of the conversation, I want to bring on former homicide detective Louis Bolaños, who now works as a private investigator and does a lot of pro bono work to help survivors of sexual assault. He's been volunteering with you, John, so I want to bring in Lewis right now. Many of you recognize Lewis. He's a regular contributor to this podcast, and we are grateful for him and his insight. Lewis, my question to you is, why was this investigated by the university police as opposed to the police department in Ann Arbor, which would have made this a criminal investigation? Right. Um, I can't answer that. It doesn't make any sense. Yet we see this happen so many times when crimes happen on campus. The University of Michigan, their uh, uh, sworn peace officers are 67 strong. To me, that just screams that they just don't have the ability to put the attention into an investigation like this that it deserves. There's a lot of I don't know. A lot of times it's ego. Um, why they don't want to let it go. They're trying to keep it in-house. Uh, I heard John mention earlier that, the, and he's absolutely correct, that the university works very, very hard at suppressing public outrage. Well, the reason motivation behind that is because they're trying to suppress the university's financial loss. There's a definite connection with that. But you will see, and John will be the first one to tell you that thank goodness the university assigned this to an officer in-house uh, by the name of Detective Mark West. And Anna, you know how much I love to give credit to officers, detectives, when they go against the grain simply because it's the right thing to do. And he did. So in this interview, just a short little recap here, but he did on uh, July 14th of 2021 to the Detroit News they ask him about this investigation, um, and he makes he. I'm going to quote him: "I can't really talk about how I feel about it. I want my job." We see that over and over and over again, and simply speaking the truth and doing what's right is career suicide for a lot of these folks. And we need to create a way where where they don't have that fear. We see that in so many cases of organizations, not just universities, but the number one reason is keep it in-house to minimize your financial loss. Right. It's all about you, the institution, protecting the institution, not about what's doing right, not about helping survivors get through this traumatic experience. I I am... What I don't understand is the university should be a mandatory reporter. I know a lot has changed over the four decades that these crimes were being committed. And I'm using that term because it is a crime. And I'm not I'm not sugarcoating this because of uh, uh, an outside agency hasn't dealt with this. I'm sorry. It's a crime and it needs to be dealt with. So, again, How is it possible if they're mandatory reporters at this time, even if they ignored that young wrestler in 1975, by the time he came back again, they had to do something. How is it possible that outside agencies have not gotten involved? I know he's dead. I get it. We can't bring him to justice. I get that. But shouldn't there still be a criminal investigation? Absolutely. Because there's still people that are alive today that were a part of the enabling and empowerment that still work at the university. And just to, yeah, they they didn't exactly ignore Tad DeMuka. They took his scholarship and then ridiculed him in front of the team. And he had to fight to get his scholarship back, but he never wrestled again. Yeah, setting the example for further victims that may consider coming forward. They see that it's scary. It's really scary. Your whole life will change backwards. Who's going to believe you? Um, it, it's just, it, it's a wave. It's a culture. Um, And John is at the tip of addressing this. He's the biggest voice that I've seen for male survivors of sexual assault in the U.S. right now. Um, And he's making a a huge difference here. And he he got our attention. So I, I hope one of our goals, one of the reasons we're getting involved here is because everything you just mentioned, Anna, right? And my conversations, long conversations with John, and as we're continuing with our investigation, that an independent investigation will happen. 
right? You heard me scream before for a grand jury investigation, other similar type cases. Well, I think this is a whole different level. level. This is screaming for a congressional inquiry. And we're in the early steps, John, I, and the team at PAVE that I work with, uh, of making that happen. We are in contact with the right folks to get that ball rolling. Um, I'm just tired of hearing plausible deniability. And there's definitely other victims out there that have no idea that this is even happening, right? right? Because they tend to move on. And, you know, I, I looked and I sent, I know you're going to post this on, on the chat below, but the Wilmer Hale <laughs> report. Yes, yes. Right. So we, let's mm -hmm. get everyone up to speed on this. So one mm -hmm. of the things the university did was they commissioned, um, you know, a very fancy law firm to investigate. We see this happening all the time with giant corporations, right? They bring in a law firm to investigate what happened. They come up with a report. Then the corporation or the institution then responds. Um, and this this is in that same playbook, if you will. The university spent close to, you know, I think $11.9 million for this report. And with $11 million, I was never interviewed. And I know several victims that were never interviewed. And at the time that they started this interview, I definitely, and throughout that process, I definitely, as Lewis said, was one of the largest voices. They knew my attorney. They knew how to get in contact with us. But, but they never did have a rebuttal to anything that I was saying publicly and denying that or you know saying that what I'm saying is not the truth. So I find it odd that people are resting on the credibility of a woman hell when they had victims that were willing to speak and willing to be out in the public, but they didn't even try to get in contact or speak to us for this investigation. I, I am still as stunned as I am as I am about how heinous these crimes are and the number, the sheer number of victims and survivors, I still cannot get my head around the fact that there has been no official criminal investigation. And I know, Lewis, you're trying to get something done in Congress, but I'm like, where's Michigan? Where is the state of Michigan? Where is the attorney general? Where is the district attorney? Where are these people? It's not in dispute, the victims. We are not disputing this. I, I, I just, it's so insulting. I am just, I'm just so angry about that part. I'm angry about the abuse and I'm even more angry at, at the disrespect to the survivors by not further investigating this by a, a, a department that is not connected to the University of Michigan. You know, we've talked a lot about Michigan and I also mentioned that when he was a doctor for the Federal Aviation Administration, how pilots and air traffic controllers were subjected to the same level of abuse during routine exams. I, I, I want to really have everyone understand the scope of how one man over the course of four decades can destroy so many people and their innocence beyond the University of Michigan's sports teams. And that's already a lot. So according to court records, Dr. Anderson abused male and female students at the School of Dentistry at the University of Michigan. Women say that their breasts were fondled. They had vaginal checks that were done without gloves. Some students say that he traded prescriptions for sexual favors. We're talking about kids who may have needed anxiety medicine. You know, whatever medicines they would have needed, it is not easy to be a young person away from home. Then there are allegations that during the Vietnam War, I mean, that gives you a mm. timeline of how long these abuses were going on, that he yes. was a doctor for young men who were drafted. And the allegations from the survivors are that he would falsify medical records so that young man would not be drafted in exchange for a sexual favor. And that's I what got him not at the dental school, but the head of university health services over the entire health service department at the University of Michigan. And from one victim that was a Vietnam aged male, you know, his parents paid him to give him a certification of that he was homosexual so that then he wouldn't be drafted. But in turn, he took the money and forced that young man 
into sexual favors or he was not going to give him that, um, you know, certification. I, I, can you, when you piece that together, that this one man over 40 years touched so many lives in such a horrible, abusive, violent, negative way, it's, it's unbelievable to me. It's unbelievable to me. I mean, John, your story alone is horrific. We multiply you by the thousands now. And you're, you know, I, I just, it's so overwhelming. Now, you mentioned that the university president at the time, back in February of 2020, made an apology, a public apology to those who had been harmed. But shortly after that, he ends up getting fired for having an inappropriate relationship with a subordinate. Oh, is that rich? Right. It's, it's very much a do as I say, not as I do mentality. But more than anything else, Michigan acts in a realm outside and above the law. I mean, it truly is a totalitarian dictatorship. Yeah. I, I want to talk about another case in Michigan because it's very pertinent to what's going on at the University of Michigan, but it also, you know, is is a case where it seems like there's been more support, public support and sympathy than there has been in the case that you're involved with, John. I'm talking about what happened at another Michigan college. You made a, a little reference to it there. Over at Michigan State University, Dr. Larry Nasser, who was the sports medicine physician at MSU and a team physician at the U.S. women's gymnastics team, he was sexually abusing female athletes during their medical exams. And there are more than 300 victims that came forward, including some of this country's most prominent female gymnasts, heroes and icons in this country, just like you and all of your football player and all your athlete friends, John. Some of his victims were as, were as young as six years old. Nasser pleaded guilty to sexual abuse and child pornography charges. The judge who sentenced Nasser sentenced him to 175 years in prison, and the judge said, I just signed your death warrant. And this is a case which we are much more familiar with. And, and the one big difference here is he was alive to be punished for his crimes and for his victims to be able to say something and, and, and share their impact statements. And Lewis, I know you feel really strongly about that, that the victims, the survivors in this case, haven't had that opportunity. Right, and we're gonna see what we can do to make that happen, right? And just because that the abuser, the suspect in this, the monster has passed away, it should not shut their voices down. Um, and simply because he passed or, or she passed, it, 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 yet it does. You know, John mentioned earlier uh, to your question, why aren't other agencies, law enforcement agencies, taking this investigation on? It's screaming of, of a conflict of interest and, and for further investigation. But I, I learned a lot in speaking with John. And one of the things he told me uh, that made complete sense was the culture, not only within the university, uh, the, the, the sports unit, environment where Bo Schembechler, the, the team, the team, the team comes first. That, that is a powerful, I, I, it's a powerful statement because it is so true, but it not only just affects the team, the students, but also the community, the law enforcement agencies around it. They don't want to do anything to bring any, any, anything uh, uh, negative to the school because they believe in it. They love it. They love the university. You can't blame them for that. But somehow the university knows how to use that to protect themselves. And I think that's one of the reasons uh, law enforcement has been very hesitant. Um, we've seen it before in other organizations, Anna, where law enforcement just lets them police themselves. Mm. And here we go again. Uh, it's a very common denominator in these type of massive assaults. There's something really, um, how can I say this, that feels very healing only in the sense that the survivors and the people of, involved in the gymnastics um, horrors have come, John, to support you and others in this case because of what they learned, how they reacted, how they've been processing this, 
And this comes out in your doc documentary, which I really urge everyone to take a minute to look at because it, it just so fully tells this story. The judge who sentenced Nasser to 175 years, Rosemary Aquilina, um, and one of Nasser's survivors, Trine Gonzar, have been a lifeline to John and your quest for justice. So here's another clip from the documentary, Hail to the Victims. I completely owe my strength and my voice to this young lady. Her fight against Nasser and Michigan State actually gave me not only the courage, but also the strategy on how we're fighting Michigan now. We're tactically looking at plans that we can take this battle plan to institution after institution after institution to help make this world a safer place. And just to introduce another one of my heroes, Mine too. she is the judge that stood up to the U.S. Olympics, to the U.S. gymnastics, and said, I am sentencing Larry Nassar to life. She's that judge. So once again, yeah. I'm surrounded by my heroes in this because we all have to get courage from others so that you speak out and you speak up. What happened with Janae and I is as we began um, supporting each other and me looking at her impact statement and trying to find, trying to find my voice, we come to find out in our investigations that Larry Nasser did his student training at the University of Michigan in 1985 under Robert Anderson. He was a football trainer. And when you talk to Trine and others that know Anderson here, they set up their houses the same. They had exam rooms in their basement. Uh, it's interesting, Lewis, you know, that the judge, usually judges are very reserved from ever saying anything publicly. And the judge in the Nasser case has, re I mean, she's one force of nature, this woman, um, speaking so publicly and in defense of John and the others. Yeah, how about that? Unheard of. I've never seen that happen before. She's my newest hero because hopefully she's setting the trend, the trend for the future. They have uh, uh, judges after the case is over be able to use what they've learned during that trial, during that investigation uh, to address other issues like this because she found something much bigger than just Larry Nasser. She found a huge monster out there that is encompassing so, so many of our universities. It's, it's massive unless someone speaks up with her credibility and what she can add to, add to it, pushing this in a positive direction, uh, we're gonna stall. So I love it that she's using her voice. John, what's that been like for you to have people like this stepping up and holding your back up? Oh, I mean, it's been uh, truly inspiring uh, because my analogy as a sexual sexual assault and rape survivor is as a victim you're on an ever shrinking island uh, you're dealing with so many different emotions people are calling you liars uh, no one's believing you and so you're being isolated and I think these institutions like the fact that we're being isolated uh, uh, one of my protests I chained myself to a tree for 70 and a half hours and the image I wanted to portray is these institutional institutions try to continually chain you to your trauma. Because if you're chained to your trauma, you can't speak out and speak up and stand in solidarity with other survivors. How have your fellow football players reacted to your being so vocal about this? Are most supportive? Are some embarrassed? How would you describe it? I would say that the and I only have knowledge of you know, the football program, but I would say that our alumni association is as fractured as it's ever been. I think that, you know, what came out of this, there was a group that supported Bo Schimbeckler uh, unconditionally uh, with the, the Bo I Knew uh, campaign and letters that were sent to ESPNs and things of that nature. Uh, to try and stop the story? To try and try, stop coverage of this? Try, trying to discredit some victims who had spoke out, like namely Bo's uh, stepson, uh, after he came out with his story of Bo, 
But the interesting thing about the fracture of the alumni, no one said anything. It was almost a month after when um, Bo's stepson came out. That was about a month or so after the Wilma Hare report proved that Bo Schembechler was one of 24 plus individuals within the or you know the the administration at the University of Michigan knew about Dr. Anderson. And so I think that what we faced is a, you know, you got two sides and there's definitely a clear line of guys that are, I don't know, delusional into thinking that a man who prided himself on bragging about, I know everything, that goes on within my football team. I know when you're out past midnight, I know when you're not in class, but you don't know that you have a serial rapist in your midst. I find that hard to believe. And I don't need to prove that because the $12 million you spent as a university to do this report actually names him in the report of one of the faculty members that met. Um, I think there is a icon, you know, idol worship, you know, setting people up on pedestals because they were a good coach or a good athlete, but that does not determine whether or not they were a good man. It's so true. Mistakes. We were we were chatting before we started recording, and I just want to share this again that I had covered a you know a horrific case involving Coach Sandusky at Penn State, and this was one of his um, survivors of sexual abuse who was abused during a summer camp, and he he came out much later, and I did that piece for. Um, Crime Watch Daily, and John, uh, I shared with you, but Lewis, I didn't get a chance to tell you that. So I do this story, and this young man was so broken. I mean, he it forever changed him. He was never able to regain his confidence on the field. He was destined to be a pro NFL player, and and it didn't happen for him. I, I I've never interviewed anyone so broken in my life. But what shocked me beyond everything else is the Sandusky deniers supporters came after me i don't care you can come after me i don't give a crap about that but that they would argue how dare anyone say these things about the coach when i i I was just stunned that anyone would stand up and defend a serial sexual predator of young people Right, but I think it goes further than that. Let's let's say there's hundreds of men that now have gone through the program where Bo Schembechler was a coach. If he didn't know, then the flip side of that is that's gross incompetence to have someone on your staff that violated and damaged so many young men if that was in a public or a private institution like maybe Ford, you couldn't go to your manager and say, I've got a supervisor that's sexually harassing 20, 30, 40, hundreds of employees and that supervisor not be fired that same day because it all rolls up steam, regardless of whether he knew or didn't know, which has been proven that he did, There is no excuse for the multitude of times that Dr. Robert Anderson, I should have never met him, and so many others should have never met him. It should have been stopped the first time, and it wasn't. Yeah, absolutely. John, you mentioned that, um, I know you've said this before, and Lewis, I know it's in the police report that you were referring to from the university police investigation. Dr. Anderson had nicknames. So this goes to what you were saying, John. Look, even if you didn't know, then how could you then not know, right, if no one complained to you, let's say you looked the other way, when you heard how he was characterized, what were his nicknames, Dr. Anderson? Uh, You know, Dr. Drop Your Pants or something? Dr. Pants, you know, I liken it too, because I never heard, like, and this is the thing, we never talked about it. 
uh, amongst any of the guys that were in my class or my roommate or anybody, it was like no one wants to go to the dentist because it was an uncomfortable scenario. But if you lay out how we had to see the doctor, we were forbidden to see any other doctors for on the field or off the field injuries. So he, in essence, was the gatekeeper for you getting out to practice and playing in the games. But it just goes to show you that while maybe what you're saying, John, is that the students didn't talk to each other, you all didn't talk about the horrific things that were happening in your exams. But, you know, this happens also when a doctor is performing an exam and then the sexual abuse is happening in that parameter within the confines of that office and you're a young person, you're still trying to figure out what's happening to you. Are you being sexually abused? I mean, we see this with children because children don't know what it is to be sexually abused. And then you gaslit. Um, you know, you you hear trainers, specifically Paul Schmidt, say things like, take your medicine, get used to it. Um, you've, you know, I've heard coaches at practice, you know, guys are hurt. You know, well, I'm just going to send you to Dr. Anderson and miraculously they finish practice. Um, yeah, it is. And from day one, you're taught or told that you've got the best medicine, the best, you know, dorms, best coaches. We're going to win. We're going to play in the Rose Bowl. We're going to do all these things. The best, the best, the best, the best, the best. So you're under the impression that this is just the most thorough and best medical treatment that you can get. At 18, when our brains aren't even fully functioning or developed, we don't know any better. There, there's something I want to talk about very specifically here, which is goes to some things that still need a lot of investigation. So um, one of the things that survivors have said, many survivors, not just you, John, many, this has been documented, um, that during these sexual assaults, these medical examinations, that the doctor asked to collect sperm samples from the students. And John, one of your quests is to figure out what happened to those samples. Why did he tell you he needed a sperm sample from you? Um, it was part of a university sanctioned andrology study in which he was testing sperm count from your freshman to your senior year of what high performance sports affect on sperm count in males. Uh, but more than anything else, going to therapy and recalling and, and remembering, there were at least two times in the four times I had to give a sample that he made an offhanded comment about, I'm studying to create the perfect black athlete. So after all of this comes out, after Michigan during uh, mediation is asking very specific questions about, you know, I hope this is not triggering anybody listening, masturbation, erection, ejaculation, and things of that nature, you start to realize that there is a sperm issue and that possibly your sperm uh, was used outside of the organization because it is well known that or talked about that Robert Anderson had a partnership with a fertility clinic that was in the same building as his uh, private practice, which we've come to find out he, it wasn't a partnership. He actually was a partner in that, as well as there were so many inconsistencies with trying to get our chain of custody of where our DNA went, our medical records uh, have been destroyed. And the fact that the university, after so many complaints, and while a sexual assault uh, uh, case is going on against them, they bias private practice in 1995. I, I'm... Not, nothing of what John just described is mentioned in this 240 page report by Wilmer Hale. Nothing, none of it, zero. How can that be? $11 million are paid for this? And, and of these 240 pages, Anna, only 71 of these pages are dedicated to the investigative summary. 
the rest of it, the, the 169 remaining pages are an appendix, right? Just footnotes and, and, and references it has nothing to do with the investigation. Uh, this is a joke. It is a joke. And this by itself should justify a congressional inquiry. So we did reach out to the University of Michigan. We're going to continue talking about what happened to all your DNA. But um, this is they've sent probably very similar statements, but I have to read it since we're talking about it. While the Wilmer Hale report contains references to Anderson's interest in male reproductive health, including the collection of semen samples, the investigative team found no evidence of the activities alleged in the press release you cite. It is also worth noting that the university provided Wilmer Hale with unfettered access to more than 200 individuals, 2 million documents from the Bentley Historical Library, 125 boxes of paper personnel files, and tens of thousands of other documents. You can review the report here. That's the one Lewis is talking about. We will link to it. So that's their answer to what happened to the sperm samples. Does that give you comfort, John? Not at all, because... If you look anywhere throughout the andrology school or anywhere else, there's no record of this celebrated and lauded Dr. Robert Anderson at the University of Michigan. They wiped out his entire history, which that's the first sign of a cover up. Is the fear here, because this is my fear, that if he indeed worked at this fertility clinic, because he worked everywhere, the man had a lot of jobs, affected a lot of people, that if he was indeed collecting and saving these sperm samples, were those samples then being used in the fertility clinic without the knowledge and consent of all of these young men, including you, John? And what does that mean about how that DNA and sperm semen could have been used and did it, was it used to father children without anyone's knowledge? I've had two conversations with a med student from the University of Michigan who was a sperm donor for this clinic. And this gentleman gave sperm twice a week for 14 years. And what stopped him from giving sperm is after 14 years, his wife gets a phone call while he's at work and the secretary of the clinic tells his wife, I just wanna let you know that I've used your husband's sperm to get pregnant. At which time the med student goes to the, Dr. Peterson, which was Dr. Anderson's partner. And the response from Dr. Peterson was, don't worry about it. We're forcing her to get an abortion. That prompted the doctor now who has a pharmaceutical company to requ request his HIPAA uh, report, all his medical information. And what he then found was that what Dr. Anderson and Dr. Peterson were doing at this clinic is they would take one sperm sample and they would cut it up to five times, making anywhere from eight to $20,000 per donation. But he was telling donors that they were working on a new IVF um, uh, procedure. Program. Mm -hmm. And so this doctor thought, I'm doing good work for science and they're injecting gerbils to try to perfect this method comes to find out today because of uh, Ancestry.com, 23andMe that has become popular over the last decade or so, that he has now somewhere between 20 and 25 kids because of this clinic. But they're telling uh, recipients that they would only use five samples of every donor. So there's just so many inconsistency and I'm not a, I'm not a ex police officer. I'm not a private investigator. I was not trained by the FBA. And this is information that I have searched for and that has come to us because of standing up to the university. We didn't solicit this information. This information came to us because there were definitely illegal uh, things going on. And specifically, this doctor who was a med student wanted answers from me because what he couldn't understand is how was this clinic rounding out 
the racial profile of sperm donors when, you know, because they were advertising for $20 a specimen in the med school, how were they getting African-American, Hispanic, because he knew the demographics of the med school. So where was he getting all this sperm? And if you look at articles that have been written in the Michigan Daily, uh, whatnot, when they stop sending out articles paying for sperm donation, actively was right around the same time that he was fired then rehired and buried. They made a social economic and racial decision to limit their liability and bury him in the athletic department, which consisted of, especially in football, the majority of African-American or lower income uh, student athletes. Lewis, what do you make of this? What do you think is going on? I, you know, everything John just described right right now reminds me of drug cartel <laughs> because they're stepping on the product. They're stepping on their money maker to maximize financial gain. Whether you're a cartel or a street level dealer, they, they step on it. I, I didn't even know that was a thing. I, I keep learning from you, John. That's crazy. Um, I, you know, it, this person came forward to John because he felt comfortable speaking with John. He was not mentioned in this. Here we go back to this investigation because he didn't feel comfortable going to them. Or, or maybe he did. And it wasn't included in here, which just screams the fact that there's probably many, many more stories just like that, um, which. The number one question that I hear from several of my teammates, whether they were sperm donors or not, Michigan men. A Michigan man, and one of them specifically said to me, "We want to know where our DNA is because we're a family. How many kids is Michigan possibly responsible for?" Yeah, and, and they deserve that. So, what that can we do to make that so f- right? Yeah. That is so frightening, and that that absolutely needs further investigation. You know, this is, again, why I'm saying these are crimes. These things need to be properly investigated, not just, you know, handled and settled in a civil court. It's far worse than that. I, I, I want to also talk about, you know, the, the long lasting damage done to all of the survivors. Um, I want to take a moment to honor and listen to Chuck Christian, who I know, John, Obviously, you're very close with. He's the first former Michigan football player to come forward to tell his story of abuse. Chuck, Chuck is dying of prostate cancer because um, after years of abuse by Dr. Anderson and those horrific exams that he was um, subjected to, which was sexual abuse, the last thing Chuck could possibly ever want to submit to would be a prostate exam or anything like that. And because of his fears, because of his fears, um, and he was too scared to see a doctor, he waited too long. And now it's too late. And now it's too late and he's dying. Um, I want to play this video from your documentary because it's cell phone video of Chuck pleading with the University of Michigan Regents to do the right thing. I just want five minutes. I'm dying of cancer. I drove from Boston 15 hours to speak to you. Can I please have five minutes? My doctors asked me why I waited so long to come in to see the doctor. They said it could have been fixed really easy, the prostate cancer. Four of my friends have died in the last year because of their fear of doctors. Michigan hasn't done the right thing in over 50 years when it comes to sexual assault. They have covered for the predators year after year after year. Now you guys have the opportunity to make things right. It is never too late to do the right thing. And you know what the right thing is. I don't know how anyone could watch that video and not cry. But here's the thing that you don't see, because we also have the um, video from the university that shows the Board of Regents and whatnot. 
They're not taking notes. They're not looking at him. Some of them are on their phones, completely ignoring uh, a celebrated African-American graduate of the art school at the University of Michigan, mentor to several kids, upstanding guy. They won't even look him in the eye and listen to him as he pleads just to hear his story. That to me is just so heartbreaking. It's so heartbreaking. And to not give him the respect that he deserves to be heard and to be seen at the very least, that is shameful. That is just shameful. I love, John, that that you're sitting outside the university president's house and you won't give up. You will see me and you will hear me. Right, because in in essence, it's a war. And we're constantly thinking about when we got out there, we grabbed the foothold. Now we have a stronghold. Now we have the eyes of the international and national media that is not afraid to go up against Michigan to find out the truth. And our voices need to be heard. But more than anything else, we realize, and we've told so many students, we can never change what happened to us, but there's a sexual assault and rape in student health and safety issue at the University of Michigan. So our voices, hearing other survivors, hearing other victims that are currently attending the University of Michigan, we can do our part to change what's happening now, making the place safer for the time being and also in the future. Even though many things have changed in this country and how we treat survivors of sexual assault, some things have not changed. Uh, Lewis and I have talked about one thing a lot over the years because of the, the work we try to do, our volunteer work. And as the mother of a young man, I know Lewis has a son, that I honestly believe that when it comes to the survivors and victims of sexual assault, that when it comes to boys and young men, there is a nearly the level of compassion, understanding, and believing um, because they're not little girls. And that breaks my heart as the mother of a boy. Well, and I think what it, society is not ready to accept that if big football players, wrestlers, hockey players, gymnasts, uh, male gymnasts, uh, just male athletes can be rape victims, then so can they. And I don't think that there's an understanding, um, you know, it's like everybody has a cancer story, whether firsthand or secondhand. But there's a lot of people with a Me Too story, and a lot of those Me Too are men. And in order to complete the racial and the, the, the individual will of what the face of sexual assault uh, looks like, it doesn't discriminate. And one in six males by the time they're 18 and a half has been affected by some type of sexual trauma. You know, numbers don't lie. And so we have to be as vocal as possible so that we can leave the world a better place than what was left to us. I'm just so grateful for your voice, John, for your strength and, um, I wish I'd gone to school with you. <laughs> I, I would have loved university with you. <laughs> we would have been good friends at the cafeteria. <laughs> um, I'm very appreciative. Also, you know, um, it's been hard. They've pushed back hard on you. And um, you've stayed strong. And um, Lewis knows that more than anyone. That I do. That I do. I'm. 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 I'm so proud and 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 blessed to have crossed paths with you, John. I and it's just amazing what you've been able to accomplish. And when I say you're at the pinnacle of this, representing males across this country, I, I, I seriously mean it. And I, I know for a fact already, you've made an extremely positive difference out here in Southern California, which is where I'm located at. Because um, John, through his generosity, and I asked him once, and he said yes. He spoke to a victim out here in Southern California who was thinking about going public with his name and telling his story. And after John spoke with him last week and they got to see each other, meet each other the first time on Zoom, that kid turned a corner and now is putting his name out there, telling his story and others will follow. 
but this is a snowball, sir, that, that you're starting. Um, so I congratulate you and I applaud you. Thank you for doing that. It's not easy. I've seen more things in the human condition as a survivor in these last two years than I think I had my entire life. And so I'm inspired by, you know, obviously Trine Gonzar, who stood up to Goliath. So I joke with her, I call her the Nasser killer, you know, um, because if not for her victim impact statement, there wouldn't have been so many others that came forward. Uh, we know it's a long road, uphill battle, climbing Mount Everest and flip-flops for men to get the same treatment, but we're willing, you know, Tad, Chuck, the guys that, you know, come to the camp to climb that mountain and to speak our truths. Um, because as I told Lewis early on, the scarlet letter of a rape victim, no one wants that participation trophy. And, and so for me, speaking through my trauma, speaking up on my trauma, it's also very healing. Because the body keeps the score, you know, and the, the longer you keep things in, the longer you suppress things, they have their way of manifesting themselves in your health and your relationships and all other things. I call them the train wrecks of life. And those train wrecks could be, you know, avoided if we deal with our trauma openly, honestly, and there's no more taboos in different cultures or families or organizations or institutions. John, I really want to thank you. I appreciate so much, not only your time, your candor, um, what you've been doing out there um, and how you're inspiring. I, I love that young people at the university stop to talk to you every day, you know, outside your tent. And I, I just, actually, that's the best gift of all, what you're yes. giving there on one-on-one -on -one yes. is just tremendous. I also want to make sure to thank Shadow Ridge Media and filmmaker Kendall Bolin for their incredibly moving documentary hail to the victims we will be linking to it so you all can watch it it's not that long and it's very moving and impressive john um thank you where can people find you or follow you if they need to talk with you if you're the only person that that they trust or through social media how can people find you you can find me on the hail to the victims website and within this next month uh, Lewis and I are planning a, a press conference mm -hmm. where there's a hotline, but I also have a separate number that I'm going to be giving to the public that if you need to call uh, my personal cell phone, that would be monitored at least 18 hours a day. Just give me a call. Excellent. Thank you for that. And Lewis, where can people find you? Thank you, Anna. I just want to add the hotline John was mentioning. Is, oh, is it ready to go? Oh, it is ready to go, up and running. <laughs> so let's do this, John. 833-44-CHILD, 833-44-CHILD, 833-442-4453. And I think that's significant because as you hear this story today, uh, we know there are victims out there that haven't felt comfortable sharing what happened to them, or maybe they did, um, but we're going to give you another avenue. Um, Give us a call. You can do it anonymously if you want. Uh, but I guarantee you, your voice will be heard. You'll feel very, very confident something was done uh, with the information you shared. And and you can always find Lewis through uh, your website, your social media. Yes, ma'am. Our entire social media footprint is at getbitinvestigations.com along with that hotline. Very good. You know, you all can find me at Anna Jean News. Um, we're going to keep following this and... Um, Lewis, I think we need to make a field trip out to Michigan. Oh, we're going to Michigan. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yes. I have to shake this man's hand, right? And uh, <laughs> many, many others that are, are along by his side. So yes, ma'am, we're going. Pleasure meeting you, John. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lewis. Um, that's it. This has been a very special edition of True Crime Daily, the podcast. You know, you can find us wherever you get your podcasts. Sub subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, but for the whole team here, uh, I'm your host, Anna Garcia, and this is True Crime Daily, the podcast. Thank you. Thank you.